Good morning and good afternoon. Welcome to another episode of Before Coffee. It is the new show, the father and daughter new show, where we find our new stories within 10 minutes. And then we, I wake up Raj and he groggily tells the news while I, I don't know. I'm not groggy at all because I just Take did yoga. Nap. So I tiredly do the news because I'm half asleep from exercising. You're, you're six hours ahead. So. Yeah, I'm six hours ahead, so I've definitely been awake for a while. Don't forget to subscribe and turn on those notifications for every time we live stream or post a video. Let's go into our headlines. Today on Before Coffee. Holding Olympics in July will be nearly impossible over extreme heat. Report from athletes and scientists warn. And it's Juneteenth, the holiday with the weirdest origin story. So we're going to go to Galveston, Texas and talk about that. 50 municipalities in the Netherlands and the Cyclist Union want action against the fat bikes. And it's also National Watch Day. And a watch believed to have been eaten by a cow turns up 50 years later. And a monolith, another monolith, has popped up in the desert. New female-led Zelda game announced by Nintendo to surprise fans and fuck their art. Why is System of a Down singer Serge Tankin lambasting Imagine Dragons? No stories of more, which is also World Sauntering Day, June 19th, 2024, on Before Coffee. All right, let's go into our first news story. I'm actually going to do the fat bike story first because it's quite short. Fat bikes, what are they? Just imagine a motorcycle, but it's a bike and it's powered, but it doesn't go fast enough like a motorcycle or a moped, but it still can, can go fast enough to hurt you if you fall off of it. And unfortunately, it's a big trend right now in the Netherlands for young people. And I don't mean like 16 year olds, I mean like 10 year olds. I've seen 10 year olds driving on these fat tires, right? Like a, like fat motorcycle tires, bikes, going way too fast. And probably, uh, well, they're not even allowed. There's like, I've, I've seen pictures of like old elementary schools, just the whole entire bike parking lot full of these things, right? 20, 50 of these bikes. And uh, yeah, it's kind of an eyesore and I really don't get it because I'm an old person, but it's also an electric bike, and I don't understand why children need to be riding electric bikes. They have muscles, okay? <laughs> electric bikes for me have always been meant for older people, you know, who have issues riding a bike. Netherlands is a bike culture place, so of course they just make new bikes for people so that everyone can bike. But now, dozens of municipalities and organizations want action against the souped up fat bikes. This is on NOS News. I don't know, I don't know if anyone wrote it, but it's on NOS News. About 50 municipalities and several organizations today are calling on, oh sorry, this was from yesterday, so I guess on June 18th, we're calling on the House of Representatives via petition to do more against souped up fat bikes. They point out that fat bikes cause unsafe situations in traffic. It is not the first time that the government has been asked to take measures to reduce the number of accidents often caused by young drivers. For example, Veiligheid NL, or Safety NL, a knowledge center for injury prevention, advocated a ban on upgraded electric bicycles for children under the age of 16. Yeah, you shouldn't be going 30 miles per hour on a bike if you're a child. Uh, like, you don't even have your bike license. There is no bike license. Minimum age. The 50 large and small municipalities spread throughout the Netherlands. The Cyclist Union, the Dust Association of Emergency Physicians, Veiligheid and L, and Doctors for Safe Cycling unite in a petition. They point out that the number of fake fat bikes in stock is increasing rapidly. And between the ages of 10 and 14, right? That's the biggest people who have this, is people who are 10 and 14 and that a quarter end up in the emergency department from brain damage. And the national measures need to be taken to stop these figures that are reported from Safety NL. That shows that ha that's half of the victims of fat bike accidents are those children. These figures make it clear that measures need to be taken quickly, must be taken to protect children and all road users, it said. 
At the end of March, outgoing minister Harbers presented a plan to prevent the proliferation of electric bicycles, including fat bikes. The signatories call this a good first step, but do not think it is enough. They also write that a souped up fat bike should no longer be sold. A minimum age should be investigated because young children cannot yes, access the dangers of driving on the street at 40 to 50 kilometers per hour. Sorry, cannot, cannot yet assess. They, they know they're going fast, but they don't have the, the quick reaction or the body unclumsiness to do it. Like, they should just not be going that fast. Nobody should be going that fast, to be honest. I had a friend who had a, a bike that was going, like, I think 50 kilometers an hour. And I'm like, I mean, I guess it's cheaper. It must have been cheaper. But I just don't, don't see the point. I don't, I don't. Finally... The group of signatories point out yet. the financial consequences for parents are significant because they can pay hospital costs and compensation if their children hit someone. Last week, and two young girls on a fat bike were injured in a collision with a car at a busy intersection in the south of Breda. The girls were 8 and 13 years old. The motorist was interrogated but not arrested because he is not a suspect in the case. Omrope Brabant has reported. So, yeah, it's just like... What are we supposed to do here? You have to, yeah, you just have to tell adults to stop buying these for their eight year old kids. No? Yeah. The eight year old girls are treated by a trauma doctor. This is from Rot Vorstersmen on uh, Ombro Brabant. The eight year old girl was rushed to hospital in Rotterdam. The 13 year old girl was taken to another hospital in ambulance. Both girls are still in a hospital as of Sunday, which was. Yeah, so this last Sunday, they were still in the hospital. Nobody was arrested for it, but obviously the cause of this is being on a fat bike and having not, not enough cognitive understanding in order to safely drive it around. Nobody was under drugs, nobody was drunk, there's no influence of alcohol, it was all just... Like, yeah, it's dangerous, I guess. But there's your story from the Netherlands on these huge fat bikes. Maybe I can find a picture of it somewhere, but I don't know. Just no. think of a bike with huge wheels, like three wheels wide. Fat, wheels. fat thick wheels. Yeah. And they're motorized. Yeah. And they're powered by basically baby. I don't even know what the hell they're, they're doing. powered by some something. They're not powered by a gas. They haven't even showed them the blood on the highway video you see in driver's head. Oh, yeah, I guess. Too fast. That's true. Look at this. Used to be, this used to be a family of four. Now it's a pile of guts. Yay! You know. Anyway, so dangerous danger in small packing. In the United States, it's Juneteenth. Galveston is the epicenter of that holiday. So we're going to investigate how they're going to celebrate it. This is from NPR.org by Alana Wise. Americans will celebrate Juneteenth in the fourth year since it was recognized as a federal holiday in 2021. But for many families in Galveston, Texas, where the holiday originated, celebrations have been a mainstay for generations. June 19th commemorates the fall of slavery in Galveston in 1865, two years after the Emancipation Proclamation ordered the liberation of black people held in the Confederacy. Of course, Galveston wasn't even part of the war, so they probably were just a locked off part of the war anyway. I have newspaper records of my great grandfather, who was but the first time in 1885. He would have been 25 years old. And he was given given that the role of reading the Emancipation Proclamation at that celebration, said 67-year-old uh, Roy Collins. Collins grew up in Galveston and said his family lineage in the city dates back to the end of the Civil War. He says the holiday was always recognized and celebrated by the black people in the city for as far back as he can trace. I can remember my mother telling us stories about there being large gatherings in the city park and people would have roasted meats. Collins recounts. 
My father and his friends were very creative with the barbecue experience. They would use meats that you could recognize, and they also had some meats that no one could recognize. And you just didn't want to ask too many questions about what that meat was, he recalled in amusement. I just enjoyed the lightness of it. The, the, to celebrate this year, as it does in most years, the Island City will host a reading of General Order Number 3, which served to enforce freeing those still held in slavery, a historic march creating the early freedom celebrations and even a swanky Juneteenth gala that runs $400 a table. Candace Reese is another Texan who considers Galveston her hometown. Her grandfather, Reverend James B. Thomas, was instrumental in getting Juneteenth celebrated as a Texas state holiday in the 1970s. He was intentional about making sure that the young people were participants. She recalled her grandfather standing on a street corner on megaphone yelling, Galveston's only known for two things, hurricanes and Juneteenth. Why don't you celebrate Juneteenth? Well, that's fair. Galveston's known for that too. Hurricanes. That's in the Gulf of Mexico. A former Miss Juneteenth Reese, Reese, a former Miss this is a hard sentence to say. A former Miss Juneteenth, Reese, who was raised in Dallas, would travel to Galveston every summer for Juneteenth, marching and showing off dance moves in the parade. Reese's family, Reese's 180 year, Reese's family's 180 year history in Galveston is long and storied. Her great 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 grandfather was John Menard Thomas, once enslaved by Michael Menard, the co-founder of the city. As part of the celebrations, a recent tradition for Reese and her family is Freedom Four of the island, including the historic Menard House, where her ancestors spent much of their lives enslaved. Also, in Reese's also key in Reese's honoring the holiday is supporting Black businesses on Juneteenth, on Juneteenth, and the 19th of every month. Juneteenth is about economic empowerment for those who are descendants of those who were enslaved because there's so much ground still that each generation has to make up, she said. Torin Collins considers herself lucky to have grown up in a culture that celebrates Juneteenth. Her family owns a former Confederate plantation on the, in the state, and every year her father hosts a massive Juneteenth celebration to educate and connect the community. The nation is kind of playing catch up, she said. I was raised with the awareness of like how important Juneteenth is and how much we need to remember history and where we started and kind of the dark chapter that everyone tries to sweep under the rug, she said. Colin's favorite memories of Juneteenth growing up include reenactments of the reading of the Emancipation, Emancipation Proclamation and Frederick Douglass scathing oration. What, what to the slave is the 4th of July as the family grilled hot dogs and hamburgers on the land where black people were once held in bonding. Well, I can say that in Maryland, you know, that's very wide swaths of America that slaves. But Juneteenth is different because these people are unaware that they were free. Once, this, once the war ended, basically, they were free. The Emancipation Proclamation didn't free the slaves, just for the people that don't know American history. Because, well, it was during the Civil War when it was signed, and the United States had no purview over this, the Confederate States. So they made a rule that said, uh, slaves were property. Since you consider them property, we will consider them the spoils of war, and we will set them free once we take over your little part of the Confederacy. Mm -hmm. So, but still, took a long when time the to Confederacy do that. completely surrendered, <laughs> when the Confederacy completely surrendered, that in 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 essence freed the slaves, but not in Galveston and other places that didn't hear about it. Anyway. Collins has since moved away from her hometown as settled in Florida while she works on a graduate degree. But she but she said she carries memories and a message of Galveston and Juneteenth with her always. I've lived abroad all over the country. You know, no matter where I go, I carry the history of my honor of my ancestors and the honor of their struggle for freedom and their participation in the struggle for freedom. Nobody is more American than an American slave. Yes, me, because they worked forever, got no money, they got punished for even talking or reading or anything. So for them, happy Juneteenth. Back to you. Hell yeah. It really, it's really sad. 
that, you know, we didn't have social media back then, so we couldn't have just posted on Twitter, hey guys, you no longer have to worry. A whole bunch of... Stop working on the long farm. Long ways from that, that's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, we did have I, newspapers, but if you if you couldn't buy one, you wouldn't know. If you can't read, you wouldn't be able to read it, you know? So, really... Yeah, if we had social just, media, they would have heard a long time. Slavery was already bad enough, and then they just didn't even tell anybody that they weren't allowed to do it anymore. Messed up. Well, didn't, it's not like they didn't tell anybody. It's just, the word just didn't reach Texas yeah. for a long time. <laughs> like months. The, toxic, a few months the Texas Tribune the was out of print at the time because of the war. <laughs> yeah, the Texas Tribune. It was probably printed, but it was printed in propaganda font. Yeah, anyway. for sure. All right. Very sorry. All right. In... Ma, in some wacky news, guess what? It might be too hot in Paris to have the Olympics. How wacky is that? Who would have saw that coming? High temperatures may limit the ability of athletes to perform and make their make them prone to potentially fatal heat exhaustion. This is from Stuti Mistra on the Independent. Top athletes and experts have warned that extreme heat in July and August could lead to competitors collapsing or worse yet, dying at the 2024 Paris Olympics. A group of 11 Olympians, climate scientists, and heat physiologists from the University of Portsmouth sounded the alarm in a new report, Rings of Fire, released today, or no, sorry, released yesterday on 18th of June. They said intensifying heat waves had made holding the Olympics in the summers him possible as extreme temperatures limit the ability of athletes to perform and left them prone to potentially fatal heat exhaustion. Average temperature in Paris during the Olympics is expected to be 21 degrees Celsius, which is pretty hot, but maximum temperatures can exceed 30 Celsius on many days, making it harder for athletes to perform rigorous physical activities. Reminder that Paris is more north than a lot of the US, so we are closer to the sun. There's more daylight, and also, it might be a little hotter because of the ozone, depending on where the hole in the ozone is. I think the hole in the ozone has been deeply uh, filled in for the most part. But uh, just depending on you, wh where you are, the sun can affect you way differently, just how it's hitting the planet. It is a terrifying prospect when we see the direction things are heading and how rapidly the climate is deteriorating around us," said Katie Rood, a striker for New Zealand's football team. Is it? Is, I mean, it's terrifying. I guess it is terrifying. But the, we've been telling you guys for decades, Jamie Farndale, I guess it's not their fault. They're just a striker on a football team. What are they supposed to do about it? Jamie Far <laughs> Farndale, a Rugby Sevens player for Great Britain, said, it's not in an athlete's DNA to stop, and if the conditions are too dangerous, I do think there's a risk of fatalities. The climate research examined how temperatures had changed since the Olympics were last hosted in Paris and France a century ago in 1924, with analysis suggesting an average of 3.1 Celsius warning for those weeks in July and August. The researchers cited the example of 2020's Tokyo Games, the hottest in history, with the temperature soaring above 34 Celsius and humidity levels near 70%. Japan, of course, is famous for having the worst summers in history, according to everybody who's ever been to Japan in the summer. The Paris Games are expected to be the hottest in history this year, though. The year 2023 was the hottest on record, and 2024 could break that record. The report also drew parallels with the deadly heat waves in France in 2003, which claimed 14,000 lives. Speaking ahead of the report's release, Caitlin Trudeau, senior research associate at Climate Contr Central, said there was no doubt that the Earth's temperatures are on a trajectory that will make it nearly impossible, if not completely impossible, to host the Summer Olympics. If, con con if concerted efforts were not made to cut carbon emissions. The body struggles to cool down when extreme heat is combined with humidity. It can suffer heat stress, dizziness, exhaustion, and heat stroke. Yeah, if there's too much humidity, you won't sweat at all because your body's like you already have water. And because there's no wind to cool you off, you're just kind of swimming in a way in your own sweat and you're not cooling off. You're just heating up your own sweat on your body. And, uh, and then you die. 
The report recommended shifting athletic competitions to cooler months or cooler times of the day. Samuel Matisse, discuss discus thrower at the American Olympics team, said hot conditions disrupted the Olympic track and field trials in 2021, which eventually had to be held in evening, even though it was still around 30 Celsius. I think in a lot of places in the U.S. and around the world, summertime competitions, unless they're held in the middle of the night, are going to become essentially impossible, he said. Time experts also asked to enhance rehydration and cooling plans for athletes and spectators. Yeah, just have buckets and buckets of frozen towels that you can throw on athletes after they finish their whatever they're doing, running down the track. France is trying to make Paris Olympics green. One green measure is not using air conditioners. A decision that has drawn ire from participants. Instead, it plans on using eco-friendly underground cooling system that draws water from the Seine River. Some delegations are taking matters into their own hands. According to the Washington Post, several nation, national delegations are planning to show up in French capital with fleets of portable air conditioning units of their own. Mr. Farndale, who was involved with the report, said the extreme heat takes a lot away from you. I found myself in these conditions where you're literally trying to get through the next phase of play. Your hands are sweaty. You can only concentrate on catching the ball, so I think it makes a worse game. It's also dangerous. Yeah, it's because your brain is overheating. Have you ever tried to use your computer when your CPU is really hot? Guess what happens? Your, CPU, your computer crashes and shuts down. Except for you, it might never turn back on again. Uh, the, the Our squishy brains are not as uh, strong as our metal CPUs in our computers. Um, the British players say he wanted the sports sector to sound an alarm bell to prevent global heating as well as look at adaption methods such as moving the schedules. We need to fight for every tenth of the degree that we possibly can, he said. Menly athletes are already suffering before getting to Paris. Pragnia Mohan, a star Indian triathlete, said she could no longer train in her home country because of the heat. She said sponsors sought more visibility, so events tend to be held in the afternoons for maximum public turnout, meaning she had to compete in extremely dangerous conditions with the temperature soaring above 40 Celsius and humidity order over 80%. Just start, everyone just needs to start doing swimming, it sounds like. The report suggested encouraging athletes to speak about the climate crisis, fostering partnerships with sporting bodies and athletes for climate change awareness and rethinking implications of fossil fuel sponsorships in sports. For athletes, from smaller performance impacting issues like sleep disruption and last minute changes, to event timings, to exacerbated health impacts and heat related stress and injury, the consequences can be varied and wide ranging, Lord Sebastian Coe president of World Athletics and Olympic medalist said, with the global temperatures continue to rise, climate change should increasingly be viewed as an existential threat to sports. So there's your article on it's getting hot. Wow, that's so crazy. How yeah. wacky that people will be able to compete in the daytime in the hot, French Olymp in uh, in the the Olymp Paris Olympics summer. because uh, you're going to die. So. Remember going to France last year, right? France yeah, it was last, or was crazy heat September? wave, and that was September. That was September. Yeah, yeah we we're, were in September, and we were like going in the subway, and we're all sweaty, and like, wow, they're in the Olympics here. <laughs> <laughs> it's gonna be nasty hot. Nasty I hot. mean, it's even warmer now because the sun. Hopefully, they got the air conditioning. The sun is up yeah. way longer in June and July and August than in September, right? This is we're we're not even past the it peaks the, the fall it peaks solstice today or whatever. After tomorrow, yeah. like summer solstice is tomorrow or next day, somewhere in the next twenty four hours. So yeah, it's okay. gonna start going. Days are gonna start sh getting shorter, but it ain't gonna cool off. It isn't like it cools yeah. off because of that. The sun is still blaring the close to the planet the right now, and you're going to get really hot. Sun has no idea we're even here. We're just a dot out there to the sun. It don't care. Mm -hmm. All right. Anyway. Okay, so we got uh, breaking news, which I won't touch on too much today because I'll probably read a longer article tomorrow. Willie Mays, baseball Hall of Famer, one of the greats of all time, has passed away at the age of 93. So we'll just read the commissioner's statement. All of Major League Baseball's morning today as we gathered at the very ballpark where a career and legacy like no other began, commissioner said in a statement. Mays took his all-around brilliance from the Birmingham Black Barons of the Negro uh, the Negro American League to the historic Giants franchise from the coast to coast in New York to San Francisco. 
Well, he inspired generations of players and fans as the game grew and truly earned its place as our national pastime. Major League Baseball great who transcended the race barrier passed away. And back to oddity news. Oh, I send you a video, by the way. I got it. So I, I think you got it. So it's easy. It's a minute 39. You don't even have to edit, sucker. All right. And weird news today. A watch believed to have been eaten by a cow turns up 50 years later. This is from Ben Hooper. Wow. UPI. A Rolex, yeah, a Rolex watch believed to have been eaten by a cow on farmer James Steele's Shropshire, England property was found oh. 50 years later by a man with a metal detector. A British farmer was united with his Rolex watch 50 years after it was believed to become a meal for a hungry cow. Let's blame a cow. It could have been another animal. <laughs> right? James Steele, 95 said he bought the Rolex shortly after his 21st birthday in 1950, but he lost it about 20 years later while working on his Shropshire, Shropshire, you know what, England? <laughs> Come up with better names for your towns, okay? And, and these are the farmers that England are, these farm. are the farmers who are saying, we're gonna lose all our money because we are <laughs> told to save the planet. It's like, yep. sell your Rolex, dude, if you're running out of money. <laughs> Yeah, well, he bought it in 1950. What did a Rolex go for then? They might have just been you know, <laughs> if you say bucks so. then. Maybe 10 bucks. I don't know. <laughs> Steele no, said he searched so. the fields for the watch, but his only lead was a nearby cow. The cow could have eaten it with a mouthful of grass, the vet said. That's for true. Cows, you know, they don't digest anything. It just passes right through them. Uh, the cow, they, they chew everything. They chew their yeah. cut. And they won't regurgitate. They won't regurgitate metal. Metal will just pass through them, you hope, without tearing up their insides. The cow could have eaten it with a mouthful of grass, the vet said. Steele told the BBC. The watch now resurfaced 50 years later after Steele's son gave treasure hunter Liam King permission to use his metal detector to search for old coins on property. It was unclear whether the watch, which now has a green tint to its face, had indeed passed through a bovine's digestive tract. Well, if you know anything about cows, you know they don't have a digestive tract. Thank you very much. They have four stomachs, and they have no stomach acid. They do not digest anything. They chew everything. They chew it, they chew it, they chew it, it goes in the second stomach, they chew it, it goes in the third stomach, they chew it, they just keep regurgitating until it turns to poop. Yeah. They don't have a digestive tract, so I wanted to correct that little thing. I was quite pleased because I never thought I would see the watch again, but I have got it now, and... I only have half the bracelet, the other half might have disintegrated. Again, we don't necessarily know if it passed all the way through the cow. It could, they regurgitate everything. So when they regurgitate, sometimes the metal comes out and bloop, or it'll pass all the way through their system, which might kill them. So it might- Here's your husbandry lesson right for right the now. week. <laughs> yeah, well, I grew up with cows. I grew up with cows and you can't tell me nothing about cows where I won't correct you and become an asshole. <laughs> Anyway, I will yeah, tell I'll, you you're wrong not. every chance I get. I will tell you, please, and please, if you tell me, if you're a city guy and you tell me that you went cow tipping, you are lying. Cows do not sleep standing up. That's just complete horse shit somebody made up. They sleep just like you and me, laying down, not standing up, unless they got some kind of condition. Anyway, he said his watch is not in working order. Well, so much for Rolex is being any good, huh? Yeah. 50 years in a cow and it doesn't work but it well it was probably 50 years in the pasture getting stomped on and rained on actually but it did avoid rusting over the years yeah it did avoid rusting maybe it wasn't made of uh, steel maybe it's got that really good steel but really good steel said he does not plan to have the watch repaired as it would be a costly endeavor but he said he's glad to have it back as a key set hey, oh put it on the mantle Put it up there and said, uh, oh, Bessie the Heifer ate it 50 years ago. All right, there's your fun story from Cowland. And another weird story from the desert in the United States this time. This is AP News Rio Yamat. Rio is a woman. Trevor here. Gleaming monolith pops up in Nevada desert, the latest in a series of quickly vanishing, quickly vanishing structures. 
Las Vegas at AP. This strange monolith looks like it could have come from another world. Jutting out of the rocks, a remote mountain range near Las Vegas, a glimmering rectangular prism reflective circus imitates the vast desert landscape surrounding the mountain peak where it has been erected. But where did the object come from and is it still there? That's a mystery the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service said it was trying to solve after learning about it Monday through social media posts. Las Vegas Police said the social platform that on social media that members of its search and rescue unit found the otherworldly object over the weekend near Gas, part, Gas Peak, part of the vast desert National Wildlife Refuge where bighorn sheep and desert tortoises can be found roaming. At 6,937 feet, it is among the highest peaks in the area north of Las Vegas. You see a lot of weird things when people go hiking, like not being prepared for the weather, not bringing enough water, police department road. But check this out. Yeah. Photos accompanying the apartment's posts show the strange structure standing very tall, or standing tall, against a bright blue sky with distant views of Las Vegas Valley. It evokes the object that appears in the Stanley Kubrick movie 2001 Space Odyssey. Neither the police department nor its search and rescue unit immediately responded Monday to request for more information about their discovery, the latest in a series of mysterious shiny columns popping up around the globe since at least 2020. In November of that year, a similar metal monolith was found deep in the Mars-like landscape of Utah's Red Rock Desert. Then came sightings in Romania, Central California, and on the famed Fremont Street in downtown Las Vegas. All of them disappeared as quickly as they popped up. The Utah structure, which captured the world's imagination during the pandemic, is believed to be the first in the series. It stood at about 12 feet and has been embedded and had been embedded in the in the rock in the area so remote that officials didn't immediately reveal its location for fear of people getting lost or stranded and trying to find it. Hordes of curious tourists still managed to find it and along the way flattened plants with their cars and left behind human waste in the bathroom-free backcountry. Two men known for extreme sports and Utah's sweeping outdoor landscapes say it was the kind of damage that made them step in late at night and tear it down. They just tore that sucker down. All right, that's it. No more damage to wildlife for you idiots. Now for U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service said it said it is worried that the same level of damage could happen to Desert National Wildlife Refuge, which was established to protect bighorn sheep and is a home to rare plants. It is the largest wildlife refuge outside of Alaska and can cover the state of Rhode Island twice. People might come looking for it and be coming with in, inappropriate vehicles or driving where they should. Trampling plants said Krista Weiss. The refuge, the refuge's acting manager. The Utah and Nevada structures were illegally installed on federal land. Okay, that's the last sentence of the story. End of story. It's illegal. Well, obviously, you know it's illegal. If it was legal, they would just go do it in bright daylight and not worry about it. They knew it was illegal when they put it up, whoever they are. I'm going to go <laughs> ahead and blame Elon Musk because I got nobody else to blame. So. If you want to blame someone, just blame one of the top 1% and probably right. Yeah, it's, it's a, yeah, somebody can definitely afford to do this without being detected. They got too much damn money. So screw them. It ain't funny. <laughs> it ain't funny even at all. I don't even know what they're trying to do other than go, oh, yeah, we can do this. Screw you. I hope they catch you. And I don't know, give you a $50 fine or something. But uh, there's your story. There's your weird stories along with the sad news of Willie Mays. Passing away. Back to you. Okay. That was a lot of info. And I also have two stories here in the culture segment, but this first one's very, very short. New female female led Zelda game. Now, if anybody knows anything about Legend of Zelda, well, it's in the name. Legend of Zelda. Who's the main character? Not Zelda. It's actually Link. A little Jim. cute, cute oh. elf boy in a green tunic and Zelda has rarely I think maybe even a handful of times been the main character of her own franchise and they are now newly announcing a release of a new 
Legend of Zelda Echoes of Wisdom, which has Zelda as the main character. This is from Ajons, Agents France Press and on The Guardian. Nintendo surprised fans yesterday by announcing a new chapter in its 40-year-old Zelda saga, one of the Japanese video game titan's biggest franchises. During an event broadcast on the web, the firm said that Legend of Zelda Echoes of Wisdom is scheduled for release on the Switch console on the 26th of September. Eiji Anuma, producer of the Zelda series, said on a webcast from fans would be able to play as Princess Zelda herself, rather than the elf-like warrior Link, and first for an a first for an official entry in the game's canon. Yeah, there's plenty of side games with Zelda as a character. This time around, Link has vanished, and it's up to Princess Zelda to step in into the protagonist's roles. Ayo Numa said, Each new chapter of Zelda is eagerly awaited by the fans. The franchise has racked up well over 140 million sales since it began in 1986. Last year's edition, Tears of the Kingdom, sold 10 million copies in just three days. And it was also one of the first games being sold for $70. Normal version, $70. And unfortunately that means the inflation has hit the gaming market and now everybody's gonna try to sell their games for instead of 60, an extra 10, 70. Because as soon as one company gets away with it, all of the companies are like, wait, shit, we can increase our prices? Hell yeah. Nintendo showed some gameplay from the new title during the webcast, revealing cartoon-style graphics similar to 2019's Link's Awakening rather than the sleek realism of last year's game. I would not call Tears of the Kingdom realism, I'm sorry. Um, the saga is credited with helping us to forge open-world games for the players free to roam in the virtual landscape, idea later taken up by games such as Grand Theft Auto and Skyrim. So that's your short gaming news on Legend of Zelda. Finally, The Legend of Zelda saving her, I guess, the hero for once. In kind of, I guess, <laughs> wacky, more wacky news. Why the hell is Serge Tankian starting a fight with Imagine Dragons? Does he have something better to do? This is on Yours no no, News Culture with David Morquand. System of Down Serge Tankian has criticized Imagine Dragons for going ahead with their controversial gig in Azerbaijan stating that they're not good human beings as far as I'm concerned. Well, he does have a personal investment in uh, any relations with Azerbaijan. He's Armenian. Last year, System of Down's frontman Serge Tankian warned Imagine Dragons about performing in Azerbaijan. He had penned an open letter to the pop rock band, asking for them to not play in the capital, Baku, accusing the country of crimes against humanity for the military actions which he described as a looming genocide. This is, of course, referencing what happened last year in uh, the Nagorno-Karabakh region. I'm confident that you can decipher all the facts for yourself. Decide whether to cancel your concert, Tankian warned. At the time, the band's performance could help whitewash the dictatorial regime's image and that committing to the show despite what was going on in the region would have a negative impact on Imagine Dragon's brand. I was almost tempted to do his uh, quotes in, uh, in his singing voice. Ah! Negative impact! <laughs> and I'd say it really fast. Help White Watch the dictatorial regime image. Uh, anyway, but, uh... <laughs> it's a bit Whisper harder to, <laughs> to mimic should any saying important things, so I feel like I'd just be making fun of him. This is serious. He is right. The nagorno Kabak region thing is a serious... Sorry? I saw oh, you tried to... <laughs> I might not be all the price. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Imagine Dragon obviously ignored Serge Tankian at the time. AP News reported that the former chief prosecutor of the International Criminal Court had warned that Azerbaijan was preparing a full-scale genocide against ethnic Armenians. Serge Tankian is Armenian in its Nagorno-Karabakh region. Tankian wasn't the only musician to call for the concert's cancellation. Roger Waters, also famously a political head in the music industry, Brian Eno, and Thurston Moore all pushed for Imagine Dragons to pull out of the show. Performing in Baku under these circumstances, regardless of intent, can only help the government of Azerbaijan cover its crimes. I read a section of an open letter they shared last August. Imagine Dragons decided to go ahead and play the show, and Tegian has stated in a recent interview that they're not good human beings. When asked by Metal Hammer about his feelings about Ima after Am Imagine Dragons still played the gig in Baku last September, Tegan responded, I don't know these guys, but who are these people? 
I don't understand that type of thinking. Very close. Thereafter, Azerbaijan attacked the people of Nagorno-Karabakh and 120,000 people left their historical homes. He continued, Look, I'm not a judge for people to tell bands where to play, or where not to play. You have other artists playing in very questionable kingdoms run by one person where people don't have a lot of human rights. And they get that they're doing it for money, that they're artists, that they're entertaining, all of that. When there's a government that's about to commit ethnic cleansing, when Azerbaijan was starving the 120,000 Armenians in Nagorno-Karabakh and not allowing any food or medicine in, you know, as an artist, if I found that out, there's no fucking way I could have gone and played that show. But he's also Armenian, so he has a personal investment in that. Is anybody in the Imagine Dragons Armenian? No. So why would they care? I'm just... Probably not. I, I care. Right? But I'm not surprised when people who have nothing to do with something don't give a shit. Especially white Americans don't care about anybody but themselves. Generally. Uh, Armenians? That sounds like your problem. Hankin went on to say that he didn't know what to say to the artists that do that play these shows. I don't respect them as human beings. Fuck their art. They're not good human beings as far as I'm concerned. He concluded, If you are that blind to justice that you go and play a show in a country that's starving another country, illegally, according to the International Court of Justice, according to what Amnesty International is saying, what Human Rights Watch is saying, if you still go and play that country, I don't know what to say to you as a fucking human being. I don't even care about your music. If you're a bad human being, I don't give a fuck. There's, that's where I'm at with it. I have zero respect for those guys. Imagine Dragons has not responded to any of the comments made by Tankian or their musical peers. This and Madan have long spoken out against Azerbaijan and released a song in 2020 in order to raise money for a serious war being perpetrated upon our cultural homelands of Arts Artsakh and Armenia by Azerbaijan. As for Tankian, he has always been open about his political activism, every single song he's ever written, stating in an interview with NPR that he's aware and comfortable with the fact that his beliefs might cost him fans. I'm okay with that because as an artist, it's supposed to please, I'm not supposed to please everyone, Hagen said. An artist is supposed to basically try to receive through the collective consciousness whatever truths that we're trying to live by, the truths of our time. If we can't do that as artists, then we're then we're entertainers. From day one, you have to make a choice. Are you an entertainer only, or are you going to be an artist? So, which one do you choose? I am i don't think I'm very entertaining, so I definitely will go for the pretentious title of artist. I believe in what I believe, and I will fight for those, and I will tell you to leave immigrants alone, and let refugees live their lives in peace, for God's I'll sakes. This article is written with additional sources from Metal Hammer and NPR. And, uh, how wacky is that? Oh, a genocide? Let me just go ahead and host a concert real quick. Yeah, uh, yeah. It's the same as Sun City or any of those places that boycotted. I mean, Sun mm -hmm. City was the big one back in the 80s and 90s. That was, People were boycotting what's a, like a resort place in South Africa where American celebrities of the older <laughs> generation decided to go play. And then Little Steven of... The E Street Band, Bruce Springsteen's band, started something called We're Not Gonna Play Sun City and brought a lot of attention to it, the apartheid. And Lil Steven probably should have won a Nobel Peace Prize. Maybe Serge is gonna win one. But uh, he's not actually the main songwriter for System of Down as far as lyrics. He is the singer. So he doesn't really yeah, write all but I know he's songs. written some songs they're, and they're he definitely player, always definitely. talks about everything he hates yeah. about everything. Oh yeah, for, and he wrote for sure. His own songs for his solo same, project, his, uh, as well. Is but him and Duran, the, the guitar player, writes the lyrics and does some of the singing. He's got this, you know, the high squeaky voice. <laughs> you know, <laughs> why did I always set apart? Like, all right. Well, this day in history in non-Armenian genocide news. Um. Baseball news, we, uh, ironically, the day Billy Mays passed away, is the day ba the first baseball game was played. In 1846, Alexander Joy Cartwright arranged a baseball game between the New York Knickerbockers and the New York Nine at Hoboken, New Jersey. The first baseball game to use the set of rules in which today's game is played. So, happy birthday to baseball. Uh, 1865 on this day, we are going to cover June, Juneteenth again. 
With the arrival of Union soldiers in Galveston, Texas, the state's residents finally learned about the Emancipation Proclamation in 1863. The day became the annual holiday known as Juneteenth, commemorating the end of slavery in the United States. 1867 on this day, the Emperor of Mexico, Maximilian, was executed by firing squad. Bet you didn't know they had an Emperor of Mexico, did you? Well, he didn't last. 1896, American socialite Wallace War... He didn't last. He he got... He was probably just stealing people blind and they executed him. 1896, American socialite Wallace Warfield, who became the wife of Prince Edward, later Duke of Windsor, and later abdicated British throne in order to marry her, was born. Yeah, Wallace Simpson was her name. She married... uh, King Edward at the time, I believe. Or was he Prince Edward? Anyway, he abdicated and he was a Nazi. I think I think she was a Nazi too. So a couple of Nazis and we're commemorating her birth. Right, gay, whatever. 1903, Luke Gehrig, one of the most durable players in the history of a professional baseball, was born. So birthday of Luke Gehrig also. Luke Gehrig was born on the birthday of baseball. How fitting. 1910, the first... Father's Day was celebrated in Spokane, Washington. I don't know how they celebrated it. He probably got a tie. 1934, the Federal Communications Commission was organized in the United States. I have one of those licenses. I have an FCC license. I am licensed to broadcast, by golly, and I will. 1944, during the World War II, the Japanese Combined Fleet and the U.S. Fifth Fleet engaged in a major air and sea battle, the Battle of the Philippine Sea which ended the next day with U.S. victory. Yeah, we were winning the war by 1944. 1961, Great Britain recognized Kuwait's independence. Well, good for them. Couldn't pissed off the local Iraqi leaders who said, no, you can't just form a country. Yep, apparently you just can. If you're rich enough, you just get together with your friends and form a country. And Great Britain will recognize you for a little under the table bribe. 1963, Soviet cosmonaut Valentina Tereshkova, the first woman to travel in space, returned to Earth in the spacecraft Vostok 6. Big moment. 2003, actor James Gandolfini died. He played, uh, well, this is his biography. He was best known as portrayal of Mafia Boss and Family Man Tony Soprano in the HBO drama series The Sopranos which ran for eight years on HBO. This day in 2016, the Cleveland Cavaliers, led by LeBron James, defeated the Golden State Warriors in a thrilling game to claim the franchise's first NBA title. So LeBron James brought an NBA title to his hometown of Cleveland. Well, he's from Akron, I believe. Well, his home area of Cleveland. In his second stint with the team, because he was drafted by them and famously took his act to South Beach and won a couple of ma- uh, championships to Miami. All right, our featured event, the Rosenbergs were executed on this day in 1953. After a failure of court appeals and a worldwide campaign for mercy, husband and wife Julius and Ethel Rosenberg were put to death on this day in 1953, <laughs> becoming the first American civilians to be executed for espionage. And they didn't do one one hundredth of the damage that Donald Trump did, I guarantee you. But he won't get executed. Hopefully he just dies in prison. Do not trust Donald Trump at all, ever. There's no reason to. If you trust him and you're voting for Trump, you're in a cult, you're a moron, you're in a cult. You don't realize you're stupid because you're in a cult. Yeah. Also, featured biography today, Aung San Suu Kyi, Myanmar politician and opposition leader, who has four names, was born June 19th, 1945, and she is 79 today. She was born in Yangon, Myanmar, which she is the politician and opposition leader. Apparently, is not at any point been the leader of Myanmar. Okay. 1861. 
is the birthday, other birthdays today, is uh, 1861, Jose Rizal, Filipino political leader and author. Uh, Salman Rushdie's birthday today, born in 1947. Ayman al-Zahari, oh, we're, we're remembering terrorists. He says Egyptian mil militant. Well, he was born in 1951. And it's the birthday of Dirk Nowitzki, German basketball player, born in 1978. Happy birthday to Dirk. And what national day is it today? World Sauntering Day. So if you're walking today, just do kind of a casual, I don't care if I get there or not. Da, 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 da. So don't be in a hurry. Saunter everywhere. If your boss says hurry up, don't listen. Just saunter. Saunter where? Saunter over to the copy machine. Juneteenth is the day today. It's also National Watch Day. We've covered that. And also National Free BSD Day. Still don't know what that means. It's National Garfield the Cat Day. FreeBSD is an open source software that people use to solve problems. That's what it is. So there you go. And it's National Garfield the Cat Day. So that's all of it. All the days for today. I June. want some lasagna. Tomorrow's BF. Uh, anyway, <laughs> big <laughs> fucking deal. <laughs> Those are all your stories and all your days for today, June 19th, 2024, uh, before sauntering. All right, this has been Allison here from the Netherlands. Stay safe out there, drink plenty of water, get ready for that summer heat. We will see you tomorrow for Thursday 13, 13 surprises that we're gonna tell you about. And uh, don't forget, of course, to subscribe, notification bell, so you know when we go live or when we post a video and watch every, every single episode of Before Coffee. I demand that of you. <laughs> demand it. Take care out there. And here is your mic drop moment. Say who? Say Willie. Say hey. Say who? Swinging at the plate. Say hey. Say who? Say Willie. That giant Willie is Mays. great. When he hits the ball, it's long gone man. Hits it farther than camp begins. Swings the bat. Look at him just straight up. I love when people right casually the ball, catch balls in the outfield. Right. Basket catch. Yeah. I was doing this, I was playing yeah, a game and he was and giving me a catch. personality Swing test. And one of the questions which was, which role would you rather play in the baseball team? And only give me catcher, pitcher, and and uh, I think uh, first hitter. And I was like, what about the outfield? I want to be in the outfield. <laughs> Why can't I be first base? <laughs> There's way more positions in baseball than the catcher and the pitcher and the first hitter. <laughs> Willie was a five-tool guy. He he could he could hit yeah. hit with power, run. Field and throw. That's your five tools. Hit for average, hit for power, run fast, field his position as you can see with that catch, and throw with accuracy. Yeah. Wait, I mean, from the outfield, you better be able to throw. Oh, they don't put you out there if you can't throw. They'll put you in left field if you can't throw because it's the closest to the plate. Easiest <laughs> Angry, the freaking catcher is like, fuck you, no, he's not safe. He's I not safe. Up. What are you? He got pissed. No insta replay in those days. Yeah, no insta replay. He said okay. safe. Get over it. Be sure to hit the like, subscribe, and notify buttons. And follow our other channels. Toxic Alley. History of Gravy and Scratchy Old Records.